Welcome inside with the insiders alongside Judy Batista and Mike Garofolo. I am Tom Pellicero. Hope everybody enjoyed your holiday weekend. One absolutely filled with football. Grateful to be with you right now. We got a jam-packed show for you today. Frank Ragnow, the Pro Bowl center from the Lions, who just won their first division title since I was in, I want to say, the sixth grade. He's going to join us right here on the show. Can't wait to talk to him about everything going on right now in Detroit. Former Vikings coach Mike Zimmer also going to join the show. He still studies a ton of tape. He's looking to coach again. What does he see? What does he make of the MVP race? We'll talk to Zim about that and a lot more. We've also got injury updates. We've got a Steelers quarterback update. But we start with what we saw last night. It was the Ravens. It was the 49ers. The two teams with the best records in football, both number one seeds. But this one was not particularly close. Early on, 49ers driving. Brock Purdy picked off by Kyle Hamilton, who had a huge night before dropping out with a knee injury. You can take another look here as Hamilton opens up his Christmas gift. No, it's not socks. It's an interception. Purdy never saw him. All right, second quarter now. This time Purdy looking for Debo Samuel. Brandon Stevens comes flying in off the edge. It's like a volleyball play. This time Marlon Humphrey getting the interception. These are not reruns, okay? These are all separate plays that we're showing you because the very next 49ers drive, this time Brock Purdy trying to make like Lamar Jackson. He's going left, he's going right, he's going back left, he's going back right. Maybe at some point, may need to throw the ball away. He tries to fit one in here. You guessed it, Kyle Hamilton with another interception, one of the easier ones that he is going to get. Purdy's first career three interception game. That one led to a Lions, excuse me, a Ravens field goal, Mike. More coming, more of that. But in the meantime, we did have a game at one point, 13-5, weird score. This is going to make it 13-12. Christian McCaffrey's 21st total touchdown of the season, tied for the most in the NFL. Ravens add a field goal at some point, and it's 16-12. Lamar Jackson with the scramble. They showed a great replay, a great angle that showed the way Nelson Aguilar and Jackson worked together on this, the way that he broke off his route. Jackson doing a great job with all of his targets as far as some of the freelancing that's going on. Usually does that with Mark Andrews, now doing it with everybody. Like I said, another one coming. Purdy picked off as he's hit. Patrick Queen takes it back to the nine-yard line after a 21-yard return, bouncing off of defenders. Purdy hit by Travis Jones. That was his fourth question, uh, interception of the day. So now it's first and goal. The next play after the interception, Kyle Shanahan upset with what he's seeing there. Lamar Jackson, great play design to Zay Flowers for the nine-yard touchdown. Puts the Ravens up 30-12. to That looked like the Grinch celebration there. Nice job by Zay Flowers, who does a great job both nice. as a receiver and a touchdown celebrator. Shanahan telling Brock Purdy, I'm going to Darnold here. Not a permanent thing, just trying to get through this game right here. Fourth and goal, looking for George Kittle, picked off by Marcus Williams to seal the Ravens' victory, 33-19. to Their fifth straight win snaps the Niners' six-game winning streak. Our buddy Torrey Smith, he knows a little bit about quarterbacking. He's played with some good ones in his career. Says, Lamar is the MVP. Throw the numbers out the window. No player is more valuable to the team than he is to the Ravens. Roquan Smith, linebacker for the Ravens, he agrees. Oh, yeah, and our quarterback, I think if anybody watched the game, if anybody watched football this season and watched the Baltimore Ravens, they know for a fact Lamar Jackson is the uh, MVP hands down. Anyone that watches football and know football and to see the type of impact he has on the game, not even like stat-wise, but just individually, like the plays that he make quarter in and quarter out, play in and play out, compare his film to anyone else in the league, and then I would love to uh, hear what anyone else has to say after that. We welcome in our friend Brian Baldinger right now. Baldy, you hear a member of that Ravens defense calling Lamar the MVP. Last night, though, based on what they were going up against, the way the 49ers have been rolling people offensively, you got to give some type of award to the Ravens defense, too. Well, they came in the number one ranked defense in football, giving up the fewest points, and then they just got better last night. And what they do differently than everybody else is they're a zone team, a matchup zone team. And so all eyes are always on the quarterback. And so even like the first interception in the end zone to Debo Samuel, Kyle Hamilton 
Like he's a half field safety. His eyes are on Brock Purdy. He jumps right in front of the throw. And so they, there was openings initially, but you see all these tip passes that are accepted. It's because all 11 players are looking at the quarterback on any given play. They don't turn their back to the deep, uh, to the quarterback uh, on any one of these things. Like this is the interception right here. Kyle Hamilton right in front of uh, Debo Samuel right there. And so this matchup zone concept, all the pre-snap motion and shifting and formations that the 49ers do really don't come into play. The, the Ravens don't react to any of that. They sit there in their zone and they drop and they spot drop. And while there might be look like there's openings, they close very quickly because all eyes are on the quarterback. And once the quarterback sets his feet, begins the motion, you know, leads with his eyes, everybody reacts to it. And I've seen them. I've seen Jared Goff struggle. I've seen Geno Smith struggle. I've seen just about every quarterback they face struggle against this style of defense this season, Judy. I thought that was a real statement by the Ravens, delivered by the defense. They flew across the country, and they they beat up on the 49ers. I mean, they were very physical. They were around the quarterback constantly. Of course, all of the interceptions. They had four sacks, I think. Um, they were just a dominant defense. And I think the conventional wisdom coming into this game was that if the 49ers were healthy, if they had all of those weapons that they have on offense and everybody was on the field, that they were virtually unstoppable and they were stoppable and the Ravens showed us how to stop it. I, I thought it was a really impressive. We're, we're going to get to the love for Lamar Jackson, who deserves all of it. But I thought if you're looking at what delivered that Ravens victory and what delivered the message that the Ravens are for real and could be a Super Bowl team, it was the defensive performance. All right, Judy, now it's time for the Lamar Jackson love portion of the program that you just alluded to. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job. It's amazing. Uh, how they have built his confidence up, starting with the preseason, starting with training camp. Remember, he had the uh, wristband, so he could read the plays off of that. Then, or didn't have it, excuse me. Then they put it back on. It was like, let's get a base understanding of what we're trying to do. And Todd Munkin's new offense is offensive coordinator. And then you could, uh, I love when they cut to Munkin in the press box, and you could see him say, all right, number 11. Like, he'll call out the number of the play sheet and then kind of give a little bit more on the top of, uh, on top of that. Um, it, it's it's really interesting to watch that, but it's interesting to watch and exciting to watch Lamar Jackson. Niners had some blitzers off the edge and a bunch of guys diving at Jackson's legs, and it's like that's not going to get it done. He's going to escape that. He's going to step up in the pocket. I saw a lot of quarterbacks over the weekend, including the Giants' Tommy DeVito, when they're scrambling forward, have their eyes on the rush. Lamar Jackson never looks at the rush once. He's looking at what's happening down the field, and that's what make, is making him right now, Tom, an incredible passer and an incredible scrambler to create time to pass. First interview I've ever heard post-game in which the guy who jumps in says more than the guy being interviewed. Yeah. Thanks to Jihad Ward yeah. for joining the party there, Mike Garofolo. Uh <laughs> He got the Giants obviously eliminated yesterday. Tommy is devetoed. But the Eagles didn't seem like they were overly thrilled with what they put on tape either here. No, they were not. How many retweets, I wonder, you got on that Tommy devetoed uh, tweet that you surely had a ready few. when he was going to be benched on? A few. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you're right about the Eagles. It's just a weird game, a weird environment. You know, at the end of the game, we're on the sideline waiting to get our one-on-one -on -one interview. And a lot of times I like to take a little video of if it's a, a pivotal play, let's see how the sideline reacts. Well, like I said, we got a long scramble here, so we're going to have a uh, some time to set it up. But watch this sideline because this is a big victory to end a losing streak. And you would think, okay, here's the excited sideline. Nope. Who's celebrating over there? I remember a couple minutes before that, Nick Sirianni's yelling at Hassan Reddick and Jeremiah Washburn. And it was a, a, just an odd experience over there. And then the postgame locker room. A lot of guys were taking a while to speak to the media. A.J. Brown didn't want to speak. He said, yeah, I'm out of here. I'm just going to uh, bounce on this one. They were not happy with this one. You would think just like any win in the NFL is a good win, especially when you needed one as bad as the Eagles needed it. And, Baldy, I kick it to you because this didn't feel like any kind of exercising the demons. This is still a team. And, again, with the crowd chanting, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, it wasn't a clean victory. We're back to where we were with this team early in the season, which is, we're missing the style points, and against better teams, maybe it'll catch up to them like it, ha it just has in the past couple weeks? Mike, you know South Philly knows what to do. They, they, they know to run the ball. That's, that's the one thing they did well in the game. And I think it's one yeah. thing that they need to lean on as they get ready for football in January, wherever they end up, 
whether it's the number one seed or division winner, whatever it is. And so I thought they took a step in the right direction. I thought they ran a lot more power. I thought Jordan Malata put his will on people. Lane Johnson, I thought, blocked his best game of the season in the run game. Uh, you know, they had basically a new left guard in there in Sua Peta. They'll get Landon Dickerson back a, after, you know, we'll see what happens at them. But I thought up front, they moved the line of scrimmage. And I thought that was important to establish that. Mike, your interview with DeAndre Swift, he's obviously in a good mood. There's other things where I felt like they were given the Giants a great opportunity. They can't stop this play right here. That'll be a valuable play uh, when they get to the postseason because they're basically in four down territory wherever they are. But I thought they took a step in the right direction to get back to a team that can win in the playoffs the way that they ran the ball yesterday. Well, I think they took a step in the right direction just because they won. Um, but I, I was struck, as as Mike was, um, with how downtrodden they seemed. I think Jason Kelsey talked about at, at his locker, you know, the mistakes that they're still making, the penalties, those kinds of things, right? I mean, they had situations in goal to go where they had to settle for field goals and they had turnovers. And this is exactly the sort of thing we've been talking about all season long, like good teams win games like this where they're not playing their best, except we haven't really had a game with the Eagles this year where you felt like they were playing at their peak and at the level they should be playing at and that they had cleaned everything up. And now it's late in the season. And so maybe earlier in the season when even the Eagles players were like, well, a win is a win. And, you know, as as long as we keep we keep winning while we're working through these problems. Now I think you're seeing they are concerned that they're not cleaning up the mistakes. It's getting late. They, they are they're still in good position to win the division. They could even still have home field advantage. But they have to know that going into the playoffs, when you play, play better teams than the New York Giants, with two backup quarterbacks who almost came back on you at home in a game you really had to win, you, you got to clean it up. And, and time is growing short for them to clean up these mistakes. How short? We are 12 days away from the final day of the NFL regular season. That's how close we are to finding out what all these playoff scenarios are going to play out here. Baldy, thank you very much. We'll rejoin you in a bit. Also getting closer to knowing who's going to be drafting up at the top in April. Right now, of course, the Bears, by virtue of having the Panthers pick, would have the number one overall selection. You see the Giants right now would be slotted in at number five. The Patriots drop down to number four after their win against the Broncos here. Still a lot of movement that can take place here in these 12 days ahead. Right now, let's get to some news about starting with a team that's still in the playoff chase, but like so many other teams right now, has not yet wrapped up their spot. Mike, it's been a journey for Pittsburgh at the quarterback position this season. Mike Tomlin, though, has decided in this particular case, for the moment, you stay in the course. For the moment, you, you, you make it clear that it is uh, Mason Rudolph who gets the ball in Tomlin speak this week, scheduled to be the starter. They'll see where Kenny Pickett is throughout the week, but Tomlin saying that right now it is slated to be Mason Rudolph, and he played extremely well the other day against the Bengals, 290 yards, uh, two touchdowns, including this one, the George Pickens. Uh, so Mason Rudolph certainly is the hot hand right now when it comes to the Steelers' quarterbacking position. I suppose we'll keep an eye on this as the week progresses, but Tomlin's certainly making it sound like uh, it is most likely going to be Rudolph at this point. In other quarterback news, Jaguars once again have questions surrounding their quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, who, of course, last week was in the concussion protocol, got cleared on Saturday, came out on Sunday, then suffered a shoulder sprain, according to our Ian Rapport. He has had tests on it. Status is TBD moving forward. The Jaguars are slumping right now, Mike. They've got a very winnable game this week against the Carolina team that, granted, put up some points last week on offense, but still, at this stage in the season, this has kind of been the story of the season for Trevor Lawrence and the Jacksonville team that's still trying to secure their spot in January. Lawrence and the Jaguars should feel extremely fortunate that they're still in control of their playoff situation, win out, win the division. Uh, I'm, I'm as concerned with Trevor Lawrence's shoulder injury as I am with what he said after the game about uh, the way that they practice and it just doesn't carry through to Sunday. I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he is incredibly frustrated Frustrated uh, that what they're doing during the week is not translating to the playing field at this point. And 
Doug Peterson's got to find a way to right the ship here, stop this negative momentum. He tried last week to fill their heads with positive thoughts. Uh, not positive play right now for the Jaguars. How do you spin, Judy, on a dime right now and get this thing moving back in the right direction, particularly when your quarterback is injured? Although, unlike the concussion, this is something he could potentially power through, and he has been able to do that in his career. Right. He's never missed a game. That's the important thing to know. He's never missed a game, and they really need him. They've lost four in a row. They got very lucky uh, this past weekend when the rest of the division lost two, so nobody gained any ground on them. And they do have the Carolina Panthers ahead of them. They've got two winnable games ahead of them, so they're still in a good position to win the division. But as you mentioned, Trevor Lawrence uh, revealed that, boy, there is a lot of frustration there, a lot of mistakes being made. Again, this is another team that's not cleaning up mistakes that they need to be cleaning up as they try to push into the postseason. Trevor Lawrence sounds as concerned with their mindset as he does with their physical physical ability right now. Another injury of note in the AFC, Dolphins wide receiver Jalen Waddell was initially uh, ruled out with a shin injury on, on Sunday. Mike McDaniel clarified yesterday saying it's a high ankle sprain for Waddle, as McDaniel said, those can be tricky. Waddle's played through a ton this season. That gives us some optimism. He's going to be back sooner than later here. From my understanding, really unlikely the Waddle's going to be able to play this week for a huge game against the Ravens. If he doesn't make it back for week 18, then probably back in the postseason here. But for in the short term here, they may have to get by without one of their premier weapons. The Lions punched their ticket to the playoffs on Sunday in Minnesota. One of the many guys who have contributed to that. Lions center Frank Ragnow, who's also their Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee. He joins us next. What was it like 30 years in the making going back to Detroit and back to a division title? We'll discuss it when Frank joins us next on The Insiders. 